Catholic Broadcasting Council presents Reflections on the Paschal Mystery. Your host, Dominican Father Darren Diaz. The First Nation author and Massey lecturer Thomas King says, The truth about stories is that's all we are. We are constituted by our stories. They make us who we are and give us meaning and direction in our lives. For example, as a nation, we have many stories, some more historical than others, that give us a sense of our national identity, like the story of Laura Secord or Samuel de Champlain, or many First Nation narratives. In our own families, we have many stories, some perhaps a little embarrassing, that are handed down from one generation to the next and become family lore. These stories give us a sense of our parents and ancestors, who they were and who they are and where they came from, so that we can better appreciate our past and understand who we are today. Sometimes stories are recreated, like the Jewish Feast of Purim, when people masquerade and dramatize the story of Esther, or pageants that are so popular at Christmas, or passion plays that reenact the last days of Jesus and his resurrection. Perhaps the most famous of these is the Oberammergau that takes place in Germany. Today we enter the story of our redemption, the Paschal mystery, when God conquered death and through the death and resurrection of Jesus. Our liturgies have encouraged us to actively participate in this story, whether through waving palms in procession on Palm Sunday or during the Holy Thursday Eucharist, today when the presider will wash the feet of worshippers commemorating Jesus' own action with his disciples at the Last Supper. Tomorrow, during the Good Friday service, participants will venerate the cross and perhaps pray the stations of the cross in the evening. During these days, we are not bystanders or observers of the action that unfolds before us as though at a play or a movie. We become actors in the unfolding story of our salvation. Thus, we literally enter into the Paschal mystery through our prayers, in our worship, in our bodies, and in our minds. Over the next three days, we ask ourselves, how are we involved in this story, not only as something that happened to Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago, but as a story for the world today, the story that makes all of us Christians who we are. The Paschal Mystery refers to the passing over of Jesus from life into death into new life. In the Gospel reading from John, Jesus prepares his disciples for his departure from this world so that he can go to his Father. In other words, Jesus is preparing his disciples for his glorification on the cross. Unlike the Gospels of Mark, Matthew, and Luke, in John's Gospel account of the Last Supper, there is no institution narrative of the Eucharist, of when Jesus instructs his disciples that whenever they break bread and share the cup and say the blessing, they do so in memory of him. Instead, in John's Gospel, Jesus prepares his disciples for his glorification on the cross by mandating his disciples to follow the example that he sets in washing their feet. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, 
Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, One who has bathed does not need to wash, except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason he said, Not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe, and had returned to the table, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. If the washing of the disciples' feet is a surprising act for us today, imagine what it was like for his disciples 2,000 years ago. In Jesus' time and culture, only a slave or servant would wash the feet of his or her master or mistress. Washing another's feet after a long journey on the dusty roads of the ancient world was a sign of welcome and hospitality. Jesus acknowledges that he is indeed Lord and teacher, and that the act of washing the other's feet is suitable for someone in leadership. Right to the end of his life and ministry, Jesus reverses the expected order of things. The exalted become lowly, and the lowly exalted. In fact, he establishes a new type of relationship that replaces the master-slave or teacher-student relationship of the past. This new relationship is one of unconditional hospitality and welcome. Jesus welcomes his followers into his father's household. After the washing of the feet and before his arrest, Jesus articulates this new kind of relationship in verses 15, 12 to 16 of John's Gospel account. Jesus spells out how this act of washing their feet symbolizes a new relationship between him and his followers, saying, I no longer call you servants, but friends. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer, because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends, because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my Father. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. Now, I love my mother, and I also really love my iPad. It's very handy when traveling, and I love the TV show Modern Family, and I love sushi. And my mother might be surprised to learn that I don't love sushi in the same way that I love my mother. Love is a word that we banter about today all too easily. We use it without thinking. It conjures up sentimental and saccharine images of harlequin romances, of TV wedding shows. So our society has become desensitized to love. Unlike modern English, the ancient Greeks, Greek being the original language of our readings, realized that love is a complex and complicated and nuanced reality. And as such, the Greeks had a plethora of words to highlight its various dimensions. In the reading from John, we have two important examples captured in the Greek words philia, which refers to the love of a friend, and agape, which refers to self-sacrificing love, the love that would have us lay down our lives for another. Jesus tells his disciples that friendship, philia, is the condition of self-sacrificing love, agape. We don't arrive on the scene ready to give up our lives for another, but for the fact that we have experienced true friendship. Friendship makes us good because it transforms us to become selfless, other-oriented. Love of self and love of others coincides in friendship. The refinement of friendship made mature 
is agape. When one is willing to put everything, even one's own life, at the disposal of a friend. Friendship, philia, and self-sacrificing love, agape, are the loves that God has for us. Jesus says to his followers, I no longer call you servants, but friends. God wants a mature, not a servile, you know, like a servant, slavish type relationship with humanity. And God accomplishes this mature love through Jesus. God's philia, God's own friendship, is matured over the ages, from the dawn of creation until the self-sacrificing gift of Jesus, who makes us his friends and then gives his life for us on the cross, making us friends with God and with one another and all creation in a new way through his resurrection. God's love moves from philia to agape. This is what we celebrate over the next three days, the transformation of friendship into self-sacrificing love. This act of self-sacrificing love is not the end of the story, but the beginning of a new story, the story of restoration and recreation, the resurrection of Jesus. It is this new life that Jesus invites all of us, all of his friends, to share. When the hour came, he took his place at the table and the apostles with him. He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he did the same with the cup after supper, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. We begin the Paschal Triduum 
by remembering that Jesus freely chose to share himself with us in his death and in his resurrection, symbolized in the sacrament of bread and wine shared around the table of friendship. On this day, we enter into the story of our salvation. We remember that on the day of his betrayal, the day before he died on the cross, Jesus wanted to share himself with his friends. At the most vulnerable moment of his life, a time when he should have been thinking about saving his own skin, Jesus gives himself to us generously saying, take and eat, this is my body. Take and drink, this is my blood given for you. An act of total generosity of self. There is an ancient legend about the pelican that holds that in times of famine, the mother pelican would wound herself by pecking her breast with her beak and feed her children with her own blood to prevent them from starving. But because the mother fed her young with her own blood, she lost her own life. It's easy to see why the image of the icon nourishing her young with her own body and blood became a popular image in Christian iconography. It can be found in churches everywhere and is often on the front of altars as it symbolizes Jesus who gives himself unto death for us and nourishes us with his own body and blood so that we might live and live abundantly. Thus, in the Divine Comedy, Dante refers to Jesus as our pelican. In his hymn, Adorote, St. Thomas Aquinas writes in reference to the Eucharist, O memorial wondrous of the Lord's own death, living bread that giveth all thy creatures breath, grant my spirit ever by the life may live, to my taste thy sweetness never failing give. Pelican of mercy, Jesu Lord and God, cleanse me, wretched sinner, in thy precious blood, blood where one drop for humankind outpoured might from all transgression have the world restored. In the context of a friendship meal, a philia meal, Jesus signifies the meaning of his upcoming death, It is a death for others, a death for us, a death that would be the crowning glory of his ministry, a death as ready money for the new life of the resurrection. In sharing the Eucharist with his friends, Jesus transforms that friendship meal into an agape meal, a meal of self-sacrificing love, and invites us to share in his death and resurrection. But herein lies the rub. If we wish to share in the Eucharist, then we too must be willing to share not only in the glory of the resurrection, but in the death of Jesus. No dying, no rising. And it's not just the momentous and sacred moment of our actual death, but I think our lives also contain any number of deaths, endings that took us by surprise, transformations that we never expected, and changes due to illness or health. Are we paralyzed by a fear of the unknown, of the future yet to come, like the men disciples who fled? Or do we live the difficult transitions with faith and hope in the future Jesus prepares for us at his Last Supper? In sharing the Eucharist, Jesus is preparing his followers for what is to come, ministry and service. We cannot partake of the Eucharist without living out its implications in our daily lives. The story of the Paschal Mystery comes at the end of the Gospel accounts, but they have been, all of them, oriented towards this climax. And though it comes at the end of the Gospel accounts, it is really the beginning of something. We celebrate the Lord's Day on Sundays, the beginning of the week, not the end. So what is it that we are preparing for? We are preparing to live the generosity of Jesus in imitation of him in our own daily lives. The willingness to die for our friends, the courage to continue on our paths and witness to who we are and what we believe in the way we live and in the way we die. By getting on to our hands and knees and emptying ourselves of false pride, such that we may serve the most vulnerable, oppressed, and marginalized. 
realizing that we share the same human condition and are united with them through Christ. Without generous living that is self-giving, we have not really taken in the Eucharist, masticated it, consumed it, and digested it. We have merely politely nibbled on it. Our Eucharistic posture is not only on our knees in adoration, but just as importantly, on our knees in service to one another. The Joannine and the synoptic traditions of the Last Supper reveal that Jesus is present among us, not just in the bread and wine made holy through our Eucharistic prayer, but in the loving service we render one another, and especially in our service to the neediest, however small or insignificant it may seem, just like the seemingly insignificant and everyday realities of bread and wine are transformed into the extraordinary presence of Jesus as we break bread and share the cup in his memory. Our service makes Jesus present because in our service we welcome the other and give of ourselves. He came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. When he reached the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not come into the time of trial. Then he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, knelt down, and prayed, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Yet not my will but yours be done. Then an angel from heaven appeared to him and gave him strength. In his anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down on the ground. When he got up from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping because of grief. And he said to them, why are you sleeping? Get up and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. Let us begin our Easter Triduum now by giving these days the meaning that Jesus gave his own life, self-sacrificing love, 
a love that reaches beyond me, beyond our loved ones, to include everyone, especially those in need, especially those with whom we have difficulties, especially those who are in need of forgiveness and a loving word from us. Let the meaning we give our Easter celebrations this year be the same meaning we give our entire lives as we live as an Easter people throughout the year. Let us do so by the symbolic act which Jesus gave us of loving service, the washing of feet. In the celebration of the Lord's Supper, we remember that every Eucharistic celebration is a celebration of the passing over of Jesus from life into death into new life. What we celebrate in an especially dramatic way over the next three days is what we celebrate at every Sunday and at every daily Eucharist. When we partake of the Eucharist, we are affirming this meaning in our Amen. We die to the old and rise anew. Amen. Every Eucharist is the sign and symbol of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Eucharist means good grace. It is the good grace that prepares us for the next step in our journey, for the transitions and transformations that discombobulate us, for giving our lives in service to the other, for Calvary and the glory of the cross. Over the next three days, we shall recount the story of our redemption in the Paschal mystery of Jesus Christ. We joyfully remember that this is not just a story about Jesus, but it is also our story. It makes us who we are and gives meaning and direction to our lives because, after all, the truth about stories is that's all we are.